Hi there, and welcome to River City Church Online. Millions of girls like Mahana walk up to six kilometers every day for water that can make them sick. That's 3.7 miles. And what's in the water isn't the only threat. As they walk, they risk abuse, trafficking, and dangerous animals. Flooding or falling can lead to drownings. And the time spent walking means girls miss school or drop out entirely. Entire futures gone. Globally, one in 10 people have no access to clean water. That's why at World Vision, our passion for clean water runs deep. Deep enough to reach one new person every 10 seconds and three more schools every day with clean water. So girls can be in class, moms can run households and businesses, and kids can be healthy. Join World Vision's Global 6K for Water and change lives by bringing clean water access to those who need it most. Discover, connect, and grow with River City Church. On May 20th, come out and join River City Church for the World Vision Global 6K Walk for Water. This event will begin at 10 a.m. at Riverside Park in Cambridge, Ontario. To help make a difference, please register online at www.rivercitychurch.org. My name is Juliette Hurst, and I'm the pastor of spiritual growth here at River City. We're so glad that you came and joined us today, and we'll do our best to make sure we have our services posted by Wednesdays each week. We also have a children's program on Sunday mornings um, from birth to um, grade six, and here we learn about Jesus, what it's like to walk with God and become more like Him. We also have youth and small groups running throughout the week. And if you have any questions or want any more information on that, please message me at discipleship at rivercitychurch.org. I really hope you enjoy the message today. So it's uh, cool that they use that rock song because I have a little analogy here. Uh, some of you have seen this before, but essentially I've got three jars here and then one larger jar. And in this one I've got sand and it's filled right to the brim. Here I've got pebbles. There's several pebbles in there right to the brim. And then here I've got just uh, two larger rocks. And uh, believe it or not, all that stuff is going to fit in the one jar um, but the only way that all that will fit in the one jar is if you put it in the right order, right? So if you start with the um, sand, you're going to have lots of stuff that's not going to fit in the, in the jar. And if you start with the pebbles even, you're going to have some stuff that won't fit. And just to show you I know what I'm talking about, we'll uh, put the rocks in first, and then we'll put our pebbles in. You can see it's pretty much full already, right? Sand's not even in there. And this is going to all fit in there yet. Fingers crossed. It smokes. What kind of sand is this? Whew. Isn't that cool? Oh, hopefully I won't knock that over. What is the smoke thing going on here? Anyway, uh, what this illustrates is uh, it's an illustration of life. It's about priorities. And it's about how if you want your life to have maximum impact, then you've got to start with your biggest priorities. The most weighty things in your life have to go in the jar first. And then you can start with the lesser things and you'll still have room for the least important things, but if you start the other way around, it's just not going to work. And not only will your life not be as full, uh, you won't be as productive, but more important by far is you'll probably have a lot of regrets later in life. And this illustrates the importance of putting first things first. And I shared that at the start of the message because today's message from Joshua is about prioritizing. It's about putting first things first. 
Now again, we're in this series in a fast-paced book of the Old Testament called Joshua. And as the title suggests, it's named after a leader that God instructed to lead his people out of the wilderness into the promised land. And that leader's name was Joshua. And once they were in the land, they were to take possession of it. The challenge being, the land is already occupied by people more powerful and bigger than God's people, the Israelites. Hence, his people would need courage. Lots of courage. Now, we may not face the physical enemies that the Israelites faced, but we know what it is to have spiritual battles, right? To struggle, to wrestle, to fight for the faith that we have. Plus, we know the experience of living in challenging times. How many of you watched, witnessed some part of the coronation yesterday? All right, so about a fifth of you. Good Commonwealth country, fifth of us. Well, I wouldn't have done it probably, but I, was, I had a breakfast meeting in Burlington, and it was on yesterday morning really early, so I listened on CBC Radio. And what, what I found fascinating is, you know, we've been talking about the series and about being equipped to be stronger for these challenging days that we're in. It's not just believers who feel these days are challenging. Uh, they were interviewing people who were witnessing the coronation in person, and the, the repeated theme, for those of you who watch this, you know this, the repeated theme was people were saying it's so good to kind of come out for this thing and to be united in this thing because these are such dark, challenging times. These are dark and challenging times, not just for God's people, but I think, I think for, for people in the West, maybe even globally, these are tough and challenging times. Last time, we looked at Joshua chapters 3 and 4, which described Israel's crossing out of the wilderness through the Jordan River, which was dry, and into the promised land. So they're now in the land that God had promised to give them. And being that the land is already occupied, the thing that you would expect, wouldn't you, is that now the battles are going to have to start, or at least they're going to have to send people throughout the land to evict the current tenants? Wrong. In fact, it's entirely the opposite. It's entirely opposite. People, when they think of the book of Joshua, they they think of the battle of Jericho, and we're going to get to the battle of Jericho. But something significant happens before the battle of Jericho, which is even more significant, perhaps, than that battle itself. See, before they proceed to take the land, God reinstitutes two key rituals that he had initiated with his people much earlier in their history. And those two rituals are charged with meaning, not just for God's people of old, but as you'll discover, they're charged with meaning for his people today as well. So would you look with me at the first one by opening your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. We've got Bibles in the pews, red and black ones. I used to give you the page numbers. I'm not going to give the page numbers anymore because someone told me last week, Daryl, all it does is confuse us because not only do we have red Bibles and black Bibles, but we've got large print and normal print and I'd have to give you like five page numbers to get you to the right place. So Joshua is early in the Bible. It's the sixth book, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. So it's between uh, Deuteronomy and Judges. Let's go to Joshua chapter 5, and we'll pick up at verse 2. Joshua 5, verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, so they're in the land now, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Again doesn't mean a second time. In case you're wondering, there'd be nothing to circumcise. Uh, It means resume this ritual which has been on a 40-year hiatus since you left Egypt. Verse 3, so Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Ha'ar Aloth, which translates as Hill of Foreskins. Thank you for the sound effects. Now, this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on their way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness, 40 years, during their journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. That's a reference to something we talked about earlier, right? 
that the previous generation had been brought by God to the promised land and invited to enter the land, but they refused. And on the surface, they refused because they were afraid of the big people and fortified cities of the land. The sub-reason, which is more important in my opinion, is that they lacked strong enough faith in the God who invited them to take the land. Continuing on at verse 6. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that they had solemnly, that He had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So He raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. We'll talk about that in a bit. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away. That's not a coincidence. That is intentional, and this, this English translation does a good job of keeping that Hebrew sense about it in this verse. They had rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. What's the first important ritual God calls the Israelites to resume before they proceed with the conquest of the land? Anyone? Circumcision. You're all, it's the ones of you who are quiet are like, Daryl, it's so obvious. We, you said it 20 times. All right, circumcision. God initiated this ritual four centuries earlier with Abraham, and you can read about that in Genesis chapter 17. The fact is, it was a command that every Israelite on the eighth day after birth would be circumcised, and that happened if you were an Israelite, and if you, if you migrated into the Israelite community as a foreigner, then you would be circumcised as you embraced the God of the Israelites at your conversion. But for whatever reason, the Israelites hadn't obeyed that command the entire time they were in the wilderness, so for 40 years, and we'll get to the why in a bit. What's interesting, I discovered something new about circumcision this week. That's an awkward moment, isn't it? I thought that, like, only the Israelites circumcised, but apparently this practice was common in the ancient Near East, but what was unique was this. While most or many of the cultures around Israel, including some of the Canaanites, practice male circumcision, they did it as a rite of passage from boyhood to adulthood. Only the Israelites did it as a mark that you were a follower of the one true God. So they, did, they all did it as a mark that you were now an adult. The Israelites were the unique in that they did it as a sign that you were a follower of the one true God. Now, we could have a lively discussion and debate even about circumcision, the pros, the cons, the why, but we're not going to do that this morning. What there can be no debating of is this, the powerful imagery of this ritual as practiced by Israel. Cutting off the skin or the foreskin of the penis symbolized cutting off the old life which was our selfish life apart from God. And it marked a new identity as a follower of God. Right? Cutting off and getting rid of the old and embracing an entirely new identity that would define you moving forward. Now, thankfully, circumcision is no longer a requirement to be a follower of God today for God's people. It's been replaced by another ritual. Anyone know what that other one is? Sarah. You're ahead of us. We're going to get there. I'm going to ask you about the next one. Okay, what about this one? Pat? You don't know? No idea? Baptism. That's right. Baptism. Though baptism is different than circumcision, what these two rituals signify is so similar that Paul addresses them in the same breath. This is from Colossians 2, 11 and 12, and this will come up on the screen, so just keep your Bibles open to Joshua chapter 5. Paul writes, in him, that's in Jesus, you also were circumcised with a circumcision not performed with human hands. So there was no flint knife involved. 
No, your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. How? Having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through your faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So baptism, too, is a putting off of one way of life, a life apart from Jesus Christ, and putting on a new way of life in Jesus Christ. Notice, though, our putting off this old way isn't symbolized just by cutting off one tiny piece of skin, right? A foreskin. Paul says our whole self is put off when we're immersed in baptism. Our whole body is covered. We are buried and we come out of the water with a new identity in Jesus Christ. And the other cool thing about baptism is it's for males and females. For all God's people. Powerful, powerful. So ritual one is circumcision. After a 40-year hiatus, this ritual gets reinstated. The Israelites put first things first. They put this as a priority, identifying themselves as a people of God. In the final three verses of our text, we come across the second key ritual. So let's go back to Joshua 5, verse 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. That's the promised land, the land of Canaan. And that produce included unleavened bread and roasted grain. And then listen to this. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. So God provides this miracle bread for the Israelites during their wandering in the wilderness. And once they're in the promised land, they get, it sounds like, one more meal or a few more meals. But then when they start eating the produce of the land, that Miracle bread stops, right? God provided for them, and he rolled away the scorn of the Egyptians who probably thought when they saw the Israelites heading away from the Nile River, these people are doomed. You cannot survive. A whole community cannot survive in this wilderness. There's no fresh water. So if Pharaoh and the army don't kill them, they're going to just perish in the wilderness. There's no way their God is going to fulfill this promise of getting them into this promised land. So what's the second important ritual the Israelites are to resume? Sarah? Okay, that's right. So you let the so it is the Passover which does get replaced by the Lord's Supper or communion. So we're going to we're going to get there. So it's the Passover feast which God initiated in Exodus chapter 12. And he initiated on the night of the 10th and final plague in Egypt, right? All the Israelites were to take a lamb, and they were to kill the lamb and collect the blood, the meat they would eat, and the blood they were to put on the door frame, the exterior door frame of their house, because later that night, God's angel of death, God is an angel of death, think of that, God's angel of death would roam through Egypt and would pass over every home that had the blood marking the exterior door frame. Meanwhile, any home without the blood, any home that didn't have the blood, experienced death, the death of a firstborn, firstborn son, firstborn animal. And ultimately, that's what prompted Pharaoh to say, enough, you people go. And he released the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt, and they were commanded then to celebrate the Passover once a year, every year. And though Numbers chapter 9 records the Israelites celebrating the Passover one time after they left Egypt, they celebrated one time at the foot of Mount Sinai, they did not continue the remainder of the 39 years while they wandered in the wilderness. So they broke that command as well. And as Sarah mentioned, just as baptism replaces circumcision, communion or the Lord's Supper replaces the Passover. Passover celebrates God's deliverance of his people from an oppressive man and nation, Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Communion, the Lord's Supper, commemorates an even greater deliverance. God's delivering us from Satan, from sin, 
and from death. Through this meal that we're going to partake of this morning, we avail ourselves of what Jesus accomplished for us, his blood shed to save us. Through this meal, we celebrate that our freedom is in Jesus. We celebrate that our forgiveness is in Jesus. We celebrate that our cleansing of sin is in Jesus. We celebrate our unity as a church community. It's, it's, it's not just in us, one another. Our unity is in Jesus, and we celebrate that our hope for the future is in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Communion is all about Jesus. He is the sinless, spotless Lamb of God given for us. Now one question every commentator on this passage from Joshua 5 asked is this. Since God commanded circumcision in Genesis 17, and since God commanded an annual celebration of the Passover in Exodus 12, why then for 40 years, 39 years if you want to be technical with the Passover, why for all that time had the Israelites neglected to obey those commands? That's a good question. It's believed, and there could be many reasons that account for this, but the main reason that circumcision wasn't practiced, it's believed, was because of the recovery time, right? To the recovery time for a male who circumcises about two weeks. And yet the entire time that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, they never knew how long they would be at any given location before God would say, okay, it's time to travel again. So as soon as the cloud moved, they had to move. It's hard to move if you've just been circumcised, to put it bluntly. And it's believed the main reason the Passover wasn't practiced is because Passover celebrates God's deliverance, right? The promise of God's deliverance. But that earlier generation that refused to enter the land when God invited them to enter the land, their punishment was they were told, you're not going to enter the land. You're, they were not delivered. Their children, God's grace is seen in the fact that their children would get to enter the land. So it just didn't make sense to celebrate the the Passover in the wilderness while that previous generation was still around. But just imagine what it would have been like in the Israelite camp. You've seen this miracle that we talked about last week, God parting the waters of the Jordan. You're now in the land that he promised to give you, and he's reinstituted. He's called you to put first things first through circumcision through all the, the males and by way of extension the, the whole Israelite community identifying as a people of God and you're celebrating before you take possession of the land God's deliverance from Egypt trusting he's going to deliver you into this land as well. Powerful. It would have fortified their faith. It would have stoked their passion for God and for the ways of God. Though we're not in a wilderness, at least one commentator that I consulted points out how we're also prone to neglect the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And I see this especially with baptism. I mean, how many believers are there out there? And maybe even in here or listening online, how many people truly believe the gospel message that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ by grace? How many believe that? but have resisted being baptized or were baptized as infants but never made a public profession of their faith? The answer is it's a lot of people. A lot of Christians haven't been baptized or if they were baptized as an infant, they, they've never actually made a public profession of their Christian faith. And if you ask the many, they have many reasons. One reason they might not give but is a reason is they just see it as annoying, Right? It's annoying to be baptized. It just How does baptism connect to my life today? It just seems like a, a vestige of a different time and a different place. Many see it as humiliating. What, I got to get into my bathing suit and a t-shirt in front of my church family? Or if you're introverted, the idea of making a public profession of your faith in front of other people, that's humiliating. Or some don't see it as essential to salvation. Like, surely I can be saved without being baptized or without publicly professing my faith. And here's a reason they won't give you, but I think it's one of the biggest reasons. They don't want the accountability or responsibility that comes when we step out in faith like this, right? Because now you're marked. Now you are 
identifying as a disciple of Jesus Christ, 24-7, 365. But one reason ought to outweigh all of our excuses, and that reason is this. We do these things because Jesus asks us to. We do them because Jesus asks us to. After his resurrection and revealing himself to his disciples on multiple occasions, Jesus ascended. He returned to heaven. But before he returned to heaven, he gave his disciples this command, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Disciples of Jesus are to be baptized. Elsewhere, Jesus said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven, but everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Disciples of Jesus publicly confess their faith. Now, on Labor Day last year, we had uh, several baptisms, and we celebrated that, and some of you were here for that. We had it at the Johnsons at their pool. And uh, each person who was baptized, they gave their testimony, and those were recorded via video. And you've seen most of them, but we've been saving one of those baptism videos for today. It's just over two minutes long, but you'll want to check this out. So, Daryl actually stole my verse. Thanks, (laughs) Daryl. But I picked a new one. (laughs) <laughs> really quickly. Uh, it's very close to it. So Romans 6, uh, verse 5, For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will, will certainly also be united him, in him with his erection, uh, resurrection like him. So Jesus Christ is uh, uh, my Savior because he made, made us pure and holy by giving himself to uh, purchase our salvation. I'm getting baptized at River City Church because I feel that River City is my home community in, in, uh, in a church. In October of 2019, Crystal's cousin passed away and his funeral that we attended, it was one of the most powerful funerals I had ever attended. It was a, about a four hour service, but it felt like an hour because it was so inspirational and led by God. And that service moved me and moved the Holy Spirit in me. When the pandemic came during that time from October to March, I was always like, should I go to church? Well, I'm going to the gym. But then when it was locked down, then seeing Daryl on service, and then every week wanting to watch the service, and then when they opened up, went to the service, and I would have to say it was probably in October of 2020 that I rededicated my life. Then early on this year, the Holy Spirit kept moving for me to get baptized and really dedicate my life. Having him as my savior, because he gave his life to make us fresh and renewed. Otherwise, we would not be able to be seen as as whole in in God's eyes. I love that. Took Rod, Rod and I together to baptize Gary. (laughs) <laughs> so, baptism is similar to wearing a, a wedding ring. Simply wearing this ring does not make me married, but it does represent a moment in time when I made a promise and when I committed to that relationship. It tells everyone that I am committed to another person. In the same way, baptism doesn't make us right with God but does communicate that we've entered into a relationship with Jesus and that we're seeking to follow him in faith. It's very similar with profession of faith. So if you love Jesus, but you haven't participated in one or both of those historic, important rituals of the faith, then now's the time to do it. Now's the time to prioritize and and put first things first. And I would be so happy to... I'd be thrilled to talk with any of you about that after the service. Now, thankfully, in our day, I don't see this same neglect of communion or the Lord's Supper. In fact, these days, there is a real hunger from people for this meal. 
There's a yearning for it. There's an appetite for this way of representing our unity with Jesus Christ and our unity with one another in the body, the church. Even if our minds can't fully comprehend the mystery of communion, if we can't fully understand what's happening in the Lord's Supper, it's like our hearts and our souls get it. We just get it, and we know we need it. Well, today's text shows us a time when God's people of old paused and put first things first. And likewise, today, we too pause to celebrate God's greatest deliverance of us, not with a a lamb, right, an animal, but with Jesus, his son, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. We're pausing to put a first thing first. And here's my encouragement to you. When it comes to your priorities in, t- in life, make God and a relationship with him through his son Jesus your biggest rock. Always put that rock into your life, into the jar first. Let's not let what happened to the believers in Ephesus happen to us. In Revelation, you can read about this. To the church in Ephesus, Jesus said, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me as you did at first, right? The believers had lost their first love. As we transition to communion and to this meal, this is your and my opportunity to come back to our first love, to remembering that it's all about Jesus. It always was, and it always must be. So let me move down there. I'd like to pray with you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for, for today's message. We're so, we've got our agendas, and sometimes we even think our agenda is obeying you and doing what you want us to do. And thank you that. There are these times where you just say, hold on a second. You don't have to do anything, but just commune with me. Spend time with me. Reaffirm your love of me as you hear me declare over you my love of you. For the Israelites in Canaan, it was circumcision and the Passover And for us, it's baptism, profession of faith, and communion, Lord's Supper. And so as we approach this table, as we prepare our hearts to partake of this meal, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our hearts. I pray that this meal would do what you promise, and that's unite us to you, Lord Jesus. Remind us of your sacrifice of your victory, of your love for us, of the new life that we have in you. Not about what we do, but what you did. Not about our efforts, but your accomplishment and victory. And we'll just be able to rest in that grace, and as we partake of bread, as we partake of juice, it would remind us that all that we have and all that we need before God the Father, you accomplished. We praise you. We love you. We adore you. We have forgiveness in you. We have freedom in you. We have cleansing in you. We have unity in you. And we have hope in you. And so, God, would you just receive our praise for this opportunity, and would we not neglect this as a community? Would we be a community that's being nourished regularly by this meal and by your gifts to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So you, uh, your table's not quite as big as mine, but you probably received something really, really small, which uh, somebody invented at the start of pandemic, and we've been using it since. But uh, there are two lids. There's a, there's a really sensitive first one that you have to peel off, and that will get you the wafer. And then after we partake of that, then there'll be a second one, which will get you to the juice. This all goes back to the night that Jesus was arrested. He took bread, he 
gave thanks. He offered it to his disciples. And he said something that would have shocked them utterly in the moment. He said, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And so, River City, let's do that in obedience to our Savior. Let's eat this bread and remember that we have complete forgiveness of all of our sins in Jesus' name. There was more than one cup at the Passover feast that Jesus enjoyed with his disciples. But after the meal, he took a cup. And again, he gave thanks, and he offered it up to his disciples. And he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the complete forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to hand it over to our worship team, and they're going to lead us in a song of response. But before we do, I, I just felt when I was sitting there earlier and I was thinking about my message that I was going to share, talking about that coronation thing and about people seeing these as, as dark and difficult days, I just wanted to share a picture of hope with you. We have a picture of hope here, but uh, yesterday when I went to Burlington, it was to have breakfast with one of my very best friends and someone I consider a, a mentor and his wife is on this nationwide Christian organization that really all they do is they get together in person and via Zoom to pray. To pray for believers, to pray for the church in Canada, to pray for our government and our nation. And his wife, who's on the board of this Christian organization, she, she said there's been a real sense, a growing sense over the last half a year that a revival is coming. And I was like, whoa, when I heard that, we're skeptical, and we don't want to believe in revivals. Here's the image that I want to share of the revival that I believe is coming for this church and for those who nourish themselves in Jesus, for them as well, and that's this. My friend Rob, in his first year of university, he was a, a, a tree planter in British Columbia. And because uh, the school we went to gets out a month later than most universities, most students were already up in northern BC planting trees. They were supposed to be planting trees. But what they discovered on this huge tract of land where they were supposed to be planting trees, there was a fire, a peat fire under the ground. They had put the sapling in to, to plant the first tree, and there was this massive fire under the ground that nobody saw it had been smoldering all winter long. And so all those tree planters spent the first two weeks of that spring putting out this massive, massive forest fire that was under the surface that no one saw. What if God's Spirit is doing that very thing in our nation, in our church, in these days? Would the one with eyes to see see the revival that is coming? God bless you. Thanks for checking us out today. We hope that you will join us here on YouTube or in person next week to continue our study of God's Word. It would be really helpful if you could like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribing is one of the best ways to stay connected with our church as we journey together in our study of God's Word and growing to be more like Jesus Christ. If you have questions about your faith, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Contact Us tab. We would love to hear from you and learn how we can serve you better. We exist in this community because of generous support from donors like you. If you would like to support this ministry because you were blessed by what you heard today, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Giving tab. There'll be all kinds of options there for you where you can give to support our ministry in Cambridge, Ontario. Have a great week. I hope that God surprises you with his love today and every day. Thanks for watching.